Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining uh, our webinar today, The Secret of Effective Backlog Refinement, Behavior-Driven Development, presented by our professional scrum trainer, uh, Chuck Suscheck. Uh, Chuck's gonna take you through uh, this presentation today. My name is Eric Nayberg, and I run marketing and operations here at scrum.org, and I'll be your moderator throughout the event. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Chuck. Just uh, some quick guidelines. Uh, your microphones will be muted throughout, but if you have questions, if you have comments, feel free to either tweet them to at scrum.org, hashtag scrum pulse, or you can type those questions as you can see there. Um, it's the, probably the easiest way for y'all in the questions box on your go to webinar panel. Just type it in and we will respond um, if either textually or Chuck will be taking questions at the end. Next slide. And lastly from me, uh, just a little bit about scrum.org, the home of scrum. We're run and, and, and founded by Ken Schwaber, uh, the co-creator of scrum. Uh, Scrum has been around, as many of you probably know, for more than 20 years. And uh, we proudly continue to evolve Scrum, continue to push Scrum forward uh, and, and helping people learn how to deliver better products using Scrum. This webinar series is a free series. Uh, we run one to two a month and you can find them all on our YouTube channel or if you just go to scrum.org slash Scrum Pulse, you'll see the full listing of all recorded webinars. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to your uh, presenter today, Chuck Suscheck. Take it away, Chuck. Okay, thank you, sir. Before I go on a little bit further, I'm going to talk a little bit about Max Technical Training, which is where I'm presenting this from. I do a lot of training through them, and they present the entire Scrum.org curriculum, as well as a variety of other classes on technology and and. Uh, business analysis, requirements, all sorts of great stuff. If you get the chance, take a look out at their website. You can see upcoming classes coming through. So, yes, this is me, but over the years, I've grown up. I look a little bit more mature at this point. I'm a professional scrum trainer. I'm one of the few that has certifications to train the entire curriculum. I came from a de developer world, really love developing software. I'm a Java kind of fellow. I got a doctorate in computer science, a master's and a bachelor's all in computer science just because I really love this stuff. I like to think of myself as more of a strategist on uh, software development from the managerial side. How do we get I don't want to say more efficiency out of people, but more engagement out of software development professionals. I'm also one of the few uh, Cucumber approved trainers in the US. So when I go through this, a lot of this material is talking about from a Cucumber perspective, so it's more of a Java perspective. So imagine with me for a moment a time when a project went just right for you. What did it look like? What was that project like? How were the people on it? Did everybody work well in concert? Know each other pretty well. Was everybody on the same, pro same page with the product? So they knew the product pretty well. They had an idea and a vision of what that product was going to be. When that worked well, how did you figure out requirements? Hopefully it was more than just documentation. It was in-depth conversations. It was an inspect and adapt approach to figuring out these requirements. What's the costliest problem in software? Think about this for a moment, please. Is it bugs? Is it part of the product not being used? Developers are paid too highly. QA takes too much time. Requirements are misunderstood or technology is always changing. Research is set. The number one problem, requirements are misunderstood, is really the big problem. People build right, build the thing that they're asked to build, but don't quite understand what they're doing. This behavior-driven development technique is a way to encourage people to work together more closely and understand those requirements. So discrete, wordy requirements don't always work. It's more of an understanding, a shared understanding. Our brain works very well by seeing examples. It's hard to describe something in great detail 
and have it in written words or even pictures and pe people understand what's going on without looking at it in terms of analogies and metaphors, actually examples. So what we're going to do is right, start right off. Let's have an example of behavior-driven development. I'm going to give you an application. You're writing the Blue Light Special app. For those of you who remember Kmart's Blue Light Special, this is a salute to that. People get the app on their telephone, and when they connect to the store Wi-Fi, somebody in sales can say, I'm going to send out a blue light special 15% off of socks for the next 15 minutes. During that time, people are expected to go and uh, buy more socks, I suppose. So the, store, so the store can activate a blue light special. Some sort of de deal message is pre-activated for a certain amount of time. After that 15 minutes or so, it becomes inactive. Detail, the deal could be a maximum of 15 minutes, and the message is fairly short, about 500 characters. So you have to have the app on your phone. You have to be connected to the store Wi-Fi, and when the store sends out this blue light special, you have 15 minutes to go buy socks at 20% off or something to that effect, whatever the message is. So let's think of a story for this application. Good old days, how do we write a story? We say... As a, I want to sow that. And then we list out some, some uh, criteria. Here's a story for you. As a store advertising manager, I want to send out a blue light special. And you can read the rest of that. Here's some acceptance criteria. Messages are 500 pay characters or less. They only go to people that are connected to the Wi-Fi. They're only active for a minim minimum or a maximum rather of 15 minutes. Now, here's an example. When a customer is connected to the Wi-Fi, when a customer is connected to the Wi-Fi, they will receive a message. My mistake. Here's a more concrete example. Joe is connected to the Wi-Fi. When the blue light special is offered, Joe will see the message, 15% off. There's a difference between an example and a concrete example. An example is just it's a collection of words. A concrete example, on the other hand, gives you a, a role-based scenario, most likely, and very specifics on that. Here's another one. The customer isn't connected to the Wi-Fi. They will not receive a blue light message. Joe is not connected to the Wi-Fi. When the message so-and-so is sent out, Joe will not see the message. Simple. But what about odd things, like people connecting and disconnecting when the message is out there. So a blue light special with a dog food 15% off is sent out. Joe becomes connected to the Wi-Fi while that message is still active. What's going to happen? Well, we'll have to ask the product owner. We talk to the product owner, we come up with a rule. If a customer becomes connected to the Wi-Fi, the customer will receive a message as long as they were sent no more than 15 seconds before the connection occurred. The product owner made that up, which is fine. So we'd have to modify the concrete example to reflect this new rule. If you think about it, these concrete examples are great ways to do the test. The rule is something you implement in the code. Here's another one. A message is sent out, Joe becomes disconnected from the Wi-Fi as he's receiving the message. What are we going to do? Let's have a collaboration period with a product owner and figure out what should happen. That helps us to infer a more appropriate rule. If a customer becomes disconnected while receiving a message, as long as they haven't received the whole thing, the message is not going to be displayed. So what I'm trying to do is, I have a few ideas on some rules. I'll come up with concrete rules. That leads to more questions. So I'll come up with some more concrete examples that then infer back to a rule we hadn't thought of. Some other things to consider. Does it work with all mobile devices? Can it be turned off? What if the characters are too big? What if two messages are active and one person connects? Will they get both of them? What we're doing is something called inductive reasoning. You've probably heard of deductive reasoning. 
That's the uh, Sherlock Holmes way of looking at things. Elementary deduction. We move from a general principle to a known and specific conclusion. Deductive. That's This is inductive reasoning, though. We move from a specific instance into a generalized conclusion. In other words, we're drawing out conclusions by coming up with some sort of example. We're inducing more ideas on the rules that we're coming up with. It's a different way of looking at a problem. Rather than come up with concrete examples, come up with a concrete example first, which will help you come up with more specific rules that you're going to implement. So what we have is this. Pick a story. Pick some sort of acceptance criteria that exists on that story. If none exists, come up with some. From that accepted criteria, come up with a few concrete examples. From the concrete examples, you're going to have questions. Make new rules. From those new rules, you might either split a story because you have so many new rules, or you might add them as acceptance criteria to that particular story. This is the kind of collaboration where we can have the so-called three amigos, where we can take somebody from the QA perspective, somebody from the technology perspective, and somebody from the business perspective, and throughout our product backlog, refine it and refine it and refine it with these specific rules in mind, these specific steps in mind. So this is the discover aspect of behavior-driven development, believe it or not. So what is BDD, behavior-driven development? Isn't this behavior-driven development? We're going to write a bunch of scenarios that work in Cucumber or SpecFlow or some other type of tool. We'll just write a bunch of tests. That's the least powerful part of behavior-driven development. General interpretation of behavior-driven development is that it's just automation. It happens after the, after the fact. It's a different type of work that's like TDD, but it's called BDD. Here's the definition of behavior-driven development. We work together to explore, discover, and refine, and drive out behavior of the system using conversations, which I just showed you concrete examples, which I just showed you, and some automated tests. We discover behavior-driven development is not testing automation. It's not used after the code is produced. It's not just another type of test-driven development. It's not just technically focused. It is discovering examples, discovering new details of the story. It is taking some of those details and writing them out in a ubiquitous language that more people can understand. It's taking some of the top one of those ubiquitously described examples and automating them. So the benefits of this BDD is really in having conversations and discovering better examples. That can be done at any time when you're refining the product backlog, when you're coding from the, from the uh, sprint backlog, it can be done at any time. It's harder to enact the automated part because you have to write a lot of code behind it. But if you can use these collaboration techniques to discover more about requirements, you're going to get more chocolatey goodness out of this. All three of these levels, discovery, formulation, and the automation part, can help you drive out more details of the requirements. But the real bang for the buck is what we've just done coming up with concrete examples to drive out better behavior for our user stories. Some of the tools that people use for discovery, example mapping. I'll show you a few examples of that coming up. Gherkin to formulate some of those examples. And maybe Cucumber or SpecFlow to automate some of the examples. So this is inductive rule generation by examples. Acceptance test-driven development. Specification by example. Behavior-driven development. A 
according to the experts, the people who actually came up with these three different uh, no, nomenclatures, these are all the same thing. Just where on the, what side of the pond you're talking at, that they are um, called different things. This is from cucumber.io and their take on it. So let's talk about discovery for a moment. If you got a product backlog, 100% of that product backlog should at least have a title. Otherwise, you got a blank card in your product backlog. Roughly speaking, and I'm just using these numbers as an example, about 70% will have some more of the body into it. You would refine another half of it with acceptance criteria. Another 25% refined again, even more details put into it. And then we got a part of the product backlog that's ready for planning and is perhaps planned. What I'm trying to say here is that any story that's in the product backlog, as it moves more toward the top, just by virtue of things in front of it being consumed, should be refined multiple times. This discovery aspect can be used multiple times, even when the story is pulled into the sprint. If you're going to go through and add some automation, this is a great way to start out your TDD aspect of fleshing out the requirements in the sprint. So acceptance criteria, some sort of a condition, a rule is used in behavior-driven development. They're really the same thing. The reasons they call it a rule in behavior-driven development is you don't have to use Scrum, you don't have to use user stories, they just want it to be more generic in it. An acceptance criteria is just a type of rule, it's more specific, it's used on a user story, that's all. I want to talk about example mapping because this is really where you get the chocolatey goodness out of this behavior-driven development. I have a reference at the bottom. You can go and watch a YouTube video on it too. Uh, Matt came up with this. The idea is so. You have a user story, you have a rule or acceptance criteria. Come up with some concrete examples. Write them on green cards. You might have a question as you're going through coming up with these examples. If you can't figure out the question right away, put it on a red card, put it over in the corner, come back to it later. You're coming up with more examples. You figure out, geez, one of these examples is so, uh, so specific, I should make some other rule or acceptance criteria out of it. Go right ahead and do it. Rules are going to be on blue cards. Examples are on green cards come up with some more examples, more rules. In fact, you might have more questions that you add as you come up with more rules. You might even have an example that becomes a story unto itself. The idea is, do this type of example mapping with representatives of the three amigo group. Do this for no longer than 20 minutes at the max. Sit down and concentrate. That focusing and taking questions and putting them on red cards helps you to keep focused and not get wrapped around the axle and the details about certain questions. And literally, use indexed cards of those colors. Write the story on a yellow card, write the rules on the blue cards, come up with green examples. Having this more frequently and going through and doing it in short sessions is much better, trust me from that, much better than having long, multiple hour drawn out conversations. These short focus sessions help you come out with a lot of great information really quickly. There's another form that you can use for these examples. Say we have an example, we come up with a concrete example like what's on the left. We can use what's called a context action outcome table. So we could start it, write it like this. Only do that for some of your examples because what it comes into is a given when then format. That's when we start to do what's called formulation. Writing these examples in a more concrete way using a particular type of language. If you do, if you do example mapping. Don't jump just to given when then formats. Try and keep the conversation on the business side. Try to get the ideas out, not the formality. But when you figure out some examples that are really good, now's the time to start using the given when then. 
and and but also work, given when, then, and but, or an asterisk, or a scenario or feature. That's all you need to know about Gherkin. You too can look up examples on this. The idea of this particular uh, presentation is to talk more about how to use these things to drive out better conversations about the requirements. Here's an example from the business side. I want to jump over to Eclipse here. Yeah, Eclipse is working. Good. Let's hope this one doesn't die. And what I'm going to do is just start out with a feature. The business can write this. Blue light special is sent. Your business can do that. And I don't have to write this in Eclipse, by the way. I could certainly write it in Microsoft Word or any type of uh, a word processing document. I could see getting together with the business and saying, oh, okay, here's some of the features of these stories. Well, how about this? I could see all of these being worked out with not even a very technical person, just with a business. So what we're doing at this point is starting to write out some of these detailed scenarios. So we've gone through and looked at some of these scenarios. We're going to put together a little bit more of a scenario here. Um, One moment here. So I'm taking one of these scenarios and I'm flushing it out a little bit more. And we've done one similar to this. So I'm going to give a concrete example. So I can see sitting down with a business and doing this kind of a this kind of an example, can't you? It's nothing extremely technical. What we've just done is gone through and formulated one of these scenarios. So we're going to go and automate some of these tests. When you start to automate, you want to automate more of the unit tests. That might be J unit or N unit or X unit, whatever you're using. You want to automate some of the acceptance tests 
some of the really key ones that you might get wrong or some of the ones that are, are very important or odd ones. And the UI, you want to use uh, Selenium or something like that? Have a good time with it. You want to automate some of the UI testing. You're also going to do exploratory testing, such as performance testing and things along those lines. You've probably seen this pyramid. There's a high quantity of unit testing, less quantity of acceptance testing, less quantity of UI. Otherwise, things become extraordinarily brittle, uncomfortable to use. You don't get as much bang for the buck out of it. So what we'll do is we'll do this BDD. We'll pick a story. We'll discover some more with examples. We'll find some of those good examples and convert them into scenarios. Then we'll take those scenarios and generate a piece of code for it. That's where we're automating. Now, how do you write code? Hopefully, using test-driven development. You write a failing unit test, then you write the code to make the test pass, then you refactor the code, then you write another failing unit test, then you make the test pass, then you refactor the code until you get enough code that you're actually doing something reasonable that can then fulfill the scenario. So behavior-driven development is a way to put together a scenario that helps lead you to writing J unit or N unit tests, which help lead you to writing more code, refactoring the code, and eventually getting enough code there in place to implement the business level scenario. For example, a failing unit test might check for a null being returned from a particular call. A scenario might not have that in it. A failing unit test might um, also have exceptions that come back. You want to be able to handle those exceptions. You might not have that in a business level scenario. So BDD, behavior driven development that we're talking about, goes at a higher level as we start to uh, drive out these, these tests. Here's how it works. We write a feature file. The business can do that. I've just shown you a feature file. Then we take it, suck it into some magic tool. In this case, it's going to be Cucumber which comes out with something called step defs. So it translates your language into uh, a piece of code. This piece of code, by the way, when you write the feature file, you can write them in multiple languages. So it doesn't always have to be English. Then you go and write some JUnit tests, write some code, and you implement the step def. The point that I'm trying to make on this particular slide is that this tool in the middle, it's not really that much magic. It takes your written language, which is your documentation, and converts it into something that you actually implement as code. The beauty of this is when you write the step def files, when you actually write the code behind step defs that are generated, if you change your documentation, your code will break. That's a good thing. If you change your code, it's quite possible you'll break the documentation, which is the feature file, which is a good thing. It helps considerably to keep your code in sequence with the documentation. So let's go back and do a little bit of step def code generation in Eclipse. Let me scoot over to this. <clears throat> If you remember, a few minutes ago, we wrote this in Eclipse. It's beautiful. What I've done here is if you look at the structure, I actually have the blue light application out there. I have some tests. There's my unit tests. There's my step def. I'm going to show you this Cuke runner for just a second. All that's saying is look under source tests to find the feature. There it is, blue light feature. Anything that has run me in front of it, by golly, that's the one you want to run. So I'm going to go back to my feature file. And the reason these come out in different colors is that I just added a plugin into the uh, IDE. You too can find that out on the uh, marketplace. It just gives 
keywords, different colors. Now, I'm going to put run me in front of that and I'm going to go to my cuke runner I'm going to run it as a J unit test One moment, please. What do you know? Okay. typo in there. That's better. Now I run the cuke runner as a J unit test. It comes back and says, hey, it worked. You have a feature that you ran. My apologies. Customers connected the Wi-Fi. See how that relates to this exact this exact scenario here. When I go down to my console, here's the amazing thing. You can implement these steps by copying and pasting this. So it generated that piece of code. All I got to do is put it in the right file. Joe is connected to the store Wi-Fi. A message, something or rather, is sent out. Joe will see message, and then it gives you some sort of argument. If you look at it, it made those things different inputs to the method. So I'm going to go back to my code, and I've put together already a file called blue light steps. I paste that directly. And I've got to import a bunch of nice stuff from um, Cucumber and all. Now when I run it, it went in there and worked on this. So I got a piece of code that it was running. Okay. Now let's say the business is, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm going to have Joe and I'm going to have other people. I really mean this. Joe or somebody else or Maggie or Ralph. One of the ways I can do it is like so. I'll go back and run the code again. And it gives me a different kind of message. I'm going to copy it, paste it back to the code, and I can get rid of this one. And I can get rid of the one a message is sent out. I can get rid of the ones with Joe on it. So I've updated the documentation and I've changed my code to update it accordingly. These things here are called matchers. They're using a regex expression to match back to the documentation file. Notice I got Joe in quotes. If I look at the code, it figured out it must be some sort of a series of uh, letters, a string. So I'm actually generating test code, or actually acceptance level test code, directly from the feature file. 
if I were to take this to the next step, I'd go back to my unit test. I'd write some tests in here to start to test the blue light application, which would then add, I'd add more code to the blue light application itself. Then I'd go back to the blue light test steps and I'd put in things like blue light app Pardon my poor programming. I'm just going to call it that for this demonstration. And then I could put in BLA and some method that I just happened to write. I wrote a send message earlier today. Now match what I'm sending in to what's coming into this test. And now I have a fairly simple uh, test directly tied back to the feature. It ties the feature to the step def, which is code, to the actual application itself. This part is easy, uh, relatively speaking. The hard part, is, as I was saying earlier, is getting back there and figuring out what kind of tests to write, what kind of examples to use. It's this, um, pardon me, it's the discovery aspect where you get a lot of the goodness out of it. So I'm gonna open this up to questions. Before I do that, I want you to know that this is out on speaker deck. If you're interested in looking at more of this, you can go out to that speaker deck uh, presentation. Some good references, Discovery by Seb Rose. The Cucumber book, that's a really good one too. Cucumber for Java goes into a lot more details of the technology side of this. You can go to cucumber.io and look at their information. Also, example mapping is out there. I'll tell you a little bit about scrum.org in just a second here, but I do want to say if you want to learn out more about this. If you're in the Cincinnati area or in the Ohio area, uh, we teach this kind of stuff mostly through the professional Scrum developer course. We're looking at different Cucumber classes too coming up. You can go to maxtrain.com and find more information about that. Eric, can I turn this over to you for a couple moments? Sure. So you can, uh, thank you, Chuck, and we'll, we'll take questions in a moment. Start adding your questions in. Some have already come in, and we'll answer those as well. Um, and as I had said at the beginning, you can find past webcasts on that webcast uh, folder. Uh, if you just click on resources and view webcasts, uh, or on the home page, you can see featured videos, and those rotate each month and, and keep going. But there's lots of content on our website to learn from, whether it's blogs and forums from our trainers and participants, webcasts, videos, and so on. Um, our, our 220 plus professional scrum trainers from around the globe are constantly adding new content to help you learn and really help us uh, help you. So next slide, Chuck. Uh, I just talked about the blogs. There's some examples of some, some excellent blogs. And like I said, they're coming out on uh, sometimes multiple per day uh, as our trainers are working with uh, with their organizations that they work with. Uh, and as they're learning, they're continuing to, to write and evolve. Next one. And uh, with that, let's open it up for uh, some questions. Okay. Go to the next one. Just pop on to the next slide, I guess. Oh, maybe not. Uh, maybe oh, well. Not. Let's <laughs> give up on PowerPoint for today. That's okay. So um, the first question, which I think is an easy one for you, came in via Twitter. Um, so you had mentioned the three amigos, Chuck. Um, I know um, from my UML background, uh, I know who my three amigos are, but what did you mean by the three amigos? Oh, I thought that was a fairly well, under, well, well established idea. The, the point is get three representatives together. 
It doesn't have to be three people. It can be five people. It can be 10 people. It can be two people, perhaps. But get three disciplines represented when you're refining your product backlog. One representative of the business, one representative from a testing perspective, the QA people, perhaps, and one from a technical perspective, uh, normally a developer or somebody in that range. The idea is, I don't, I don't want to say we should separate QA from dev, but somebody who has a mindset that's a testing mindset and is constantly looking at it and say, hmm, can I test this? Somebody from a technical perspective saying, can I implement this? It's good enough. Next question then. Sure. So um, you, you mentioned the word step depth code. Uh, just to, to clarity, because we didn't have all developers on this on this call. Um, if you want to just describe what that meant. Sure. Step def code. Am I sharing this right now? Yes. There it is. That's the stuff that automatically gets generated that I can then end, add to my actual Java file and put in code behind it to do whatever. What's interesting about this too, this is a piece of code. It's based on the feature file. This piece of code, I could put anything in here. I can connect to uh, different websites. I can use the Selenium tool to run different websites. I can do some sort of calls to databases. The, the, the stuff behind it is endless. Once you've got a piece of code in your hand that connects directly to the, uh, uh, to the documentation, you're, you're running great. Next question, please. Sure. So how much detail is required? Like the example that you use with Joe, Joe is connected, message is sent, uh, but Joe can't see the message. How, mu how much detail do you, do you feel you need to put in in, in these descriptions? Ah. Uh, Great question. There's one of the problems that a lot of people have is they start going through this given when then format and they put given this happens and this happens and this happens and 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 you are probably abstracting it at too low of a level of detail. It should I'm sorry to be so zen about this, but it should be enough detail so that the business can help you with that, but not so much detail that it becomes brittle. If you start seeing Given Joe's connected to the Wi-Fi, and Joe has a, has an iPhone, and Joe looks at his phone, and, and, and. If you see like three or four of those, you're starting to get too many. You might want to consider it at a higher level and abstract those details out. So in other words, given Joe is connected to the Wi-Fi, in the backside, when we start to write code, we'll make sure that he has an iPhone things along those lines. So the rule of thumb is the given, the when, the then. The given part should only be about three or four. Otherwise, it's becoming too uh, too brittle. Great. So um, is it necessary to use all of the listed operators? So when you talk through your scenarios, um, so does every scenario have to have all operators given when, then, et cetera? Not really. It might be possible to have a given. In other words, you have a phone in your pocket uh, where you don't really need to even say that. You have to have some kind of a trigger to say when something happens and what you expect to see, but sometimes the given part, what's the, what's the precondition, might be inferred just by general knowledge. You do have to have some sort of a trigger, so that's the when. You do have to have some sort of a result, otherwise it's not a very good acceptance test. So you have to have at least those two statements. Another answer too, probably ask this question, how many thens should you have? One, one result. Next question, please. So how, how does BDD and, and automating acceptance criteria really relate to the feature system testing? I don't know if you can maybe go in a little bit more detail around that. 
Yeah, I'm thinking about how to say that. So a feature is usually something that's a big scale item. There's not really a direct, every feature shall have one to three scenarios in it. And every scenario should have two or three examples. There's not really something like that. It's very specific to your organization. So to me, the way I look at a feature is a feature is something along the lines of, I want climate control on my car. Okay. Well, one scenario is it's cold, so I turn up the air conditioner. One scenario is it's 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 um, it's hot in here, so I, I need to turn on the heater. I can look at that and say, oh, those are a couple scenarios, but they actually become features too, because now they're a feature within climate control, air conditioning and heating. So it's very specific to um, the domain that you're working on. Sorry, I can't give you a more concrete example there. So press on, sir. No problem. So um, here's one that, that, that's quite interesting and I, I think a good one based on what you talked about. Um, how, how do you make sure that the requirements are clear to the product owner? Uh, do we talk via examples with the end user? Um, what, what's the best way of going about making sure that the PO understands the requirements? If you're using this discovery technique, these examples, the, the concrete examples are just stellar when you start to use it with a product owner. It just happens to be the way that our mind works. We're, we're a comparison algorithm that goes on in our head most of the time. And uh, concrete examples really stimulate a different way of looking at problems. So all I can say is when you have these three Amigo meetings, invite a business representative, invite the product owner. That's even better. So, Hope so that answers it. So kind of tying to that, Chuck, um, another question just came in. Um, who's writing these scenarios in Cucumber? Is it the developer, the QA, product owner, and so on? Um, so who do you see writing writing these scenarios in Cucumber? Oh, boy. If I were to be pinned down on, on, on people specifically, I'd expect the product owner to write out a few features then to work with some of the business analysts to write out more detail on those features and come up with some scenarios. I mean, who writes the user stories? The product owner has to make sure they're written. Same thing here. The product owner would make sure that they're written and that they understand it. So the feature level and the scenario level itself, I'd say more of the product owner or business analyst or, or a business person writing these first two parts. When you get into the given, when, then, that's when you start to involve more technical people. They don't necessarily even have to write it at that level. But the person writing it, boy, I'd recommend they go through a BDD class so that they understand the stuff behind it and understand what a good given when then looks like so you can reuse it. So the, the answer is I would say uh, until you get to the point where you do a step def I wouldn't have the, the, the technologist writing those things, but I would have them uh, consulting on it. Great, so um, here's, here's another question, somewhat tied to, to the conversation, but I think it's a good one, so I wanted to bring it up. It comes up a lot. Is there a rule to involve the whole scrum team in back, backlog refinement? Is it mandatory that the entire Scrum team, how I read the question, is it mandatory that the entire Scrum team has to be at backlog refinement? So I, I'm, I'm, I, like, I like that question. I've had it before on things too. Uh, the way the Scrum Guide talks about refinement or product owner involvement is the product owner is involved enough with the team to be able to get the return on investment that they would like. If you're getting the right return on investment, you can back off on it. If you're not getting the return on investment, they're not understanding things, you need to be more involved in it. My experience has been when you have development teams together working on refinement all together, the good points of that are everybody understands what's going on, especially if you really have a cross-functional team who's all working on the requirements together. The bad part about it is you've got a lot of time with people invested in that. And if you don't have people that are cross-functional, in other words, they might grab any story, 
then it becomes a, a time sink for people who aren't that interested. My advice on something like this is start out with less people, go a sprint or two, inspect it and adapt it, specifically at the retrospective. Ask yourself, is this working okay? There's no hard and fast rule. It's very dependent on your organization. How's that, Eric? Works for me, yeah. I mean, I, I, and I'd agree. There, there's, it, it's the right people. So wh whoever are there are the right people and making sure to me that the right people are there to make those decisions and to have the input. If we're doing refinement and we don't have the people that, that, that the right folks from the development team, for example, to make the right decisions or have the right input, then we've got the wrong people. Um, and I, I can see starting it, it, out with this on a, on a feature level, coming up with some features, coming up with some rough stories, coming up with a few scenarios for those stories and what might happen, and going back to the just the stakeholders and working on that a bit. Let's come up with some rough ideas. Now let's go back and refine them a bit more. Now that all the stakeholders might not be involved in that, it might be more involved with business analysts who are closer to the product. And you know the the only way to get the right people is to try it and then purposefully inspect it and adapt it, make sure you're getting the right people. If you're not, come up with some way to make that a little bit better. That's what a retrospective is for. Uh, exactly, and, 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 and making sure we have the right, the right folks involved in, in, in reviewing it. And, and, and there's nowhere that says we don't need, we, we can't document this. Uh, we do this actually on my Scrum team um, where we'll record a session like that so that folks who maybe weren't available for whatever reason can chime in and, and see what was discussed and so on. Um, I was thinking of time for one last question and this kind of ties to this last one so I, I think we'll do, take this which is how do you ensure features and user stories are aligned? <laughs> Boy. <laughs> Might be too long of an answer here but. Boy. We can pass on that if, if it's too long. What I want to say is that features are overloaded terms. Some tools say that a feature contains stories and an epic contains stories, so they're orthogonal to each other. Some tools say an epic is not a first class type of story that you break it down into stories and features are just something else they don't even consider. Other tools say a story contains a feature which contains uh, these type of scenarios. It's so, it's so overloaded, it's not even funny. So to me, a user story is something that provides value to a customer. And to me, a feature is some piece of that value but that's not always how it's interpreted, which is why it's so funky. Keeping your features aligned with your stories has to be a team effort. And when you get your features goofed up, if you're doing this kind of a technique and writing a code behind the, behind the documentation, one would expect that the code would show that your feature is not quite put together right. One of the great books to read about that is Discovery by uh, Seb Rose. He talks a lot about that kind of thing. As a matter of fact, the book, uh, Cucumber for Java book, there's one for Ruby if you like that, but the Cucumber for Java book, he goes into a really well-worked example at the wording level. I mean, it's very detailed. He says, oh, you have a customer, that infers that this is happening. Or, oh, you have a an account, that infers this. So we should rework the scenario with different domain words. So it's more than I can explain in just you know a, a couple minutes here, but really go out and get Cucumber for Java or get the discovery book by Seb Rose. You'll, you'll, not, you'll not regret it. Great, and, and with that, I think we're out of time. I, I know we didn't get to all of them, but uh... I apologize, uh, but uh, I want to be courteous of our time box. And uh, thank you very much, Chuck. Thank you, Max Train, for, for helping to support this. And uh, feel free to follow up directly with Chuck as well. And, and the recording, as well as the slides, will be available over the next uh, day or so via the Scrum.org website. With that, thank you, and have a good rest of your day.